Steinbeck and Ricketts certainly had a scientific partnership in Sea Cortez, but I don't think their scientific partnership was really the overwhelming uh, glue that held them together. glue that held them together was the ideas encompassed in Ricketts' essays, non-teleological thinking for one, the holistic sense that everything's connected to everything else. It's just a work that creates connections in and of itself. That's true of a lot of Steinbeck's works. He cared a lot about connections. Among the great beautiful aspects of Steinbeck's storytelling is the profound connections that his human characters have with each other. This reflects so much of the elemental connectivity that he would have gleaned from being with Ricketts in the natural environment. In 1940, John Steinbeck spent six weeks in nature with his best friend, marine biologist Ed Ricketts. They combed the intertidal of Mexico's Sea of Cortez, studying marine animals, but with a different agenda than others who had done the same. Up until Ed Ricketts, most marine biologists thought of animals in terms of their taxonomic groups, their phyla, their genus, their species. They thought about mollusks versus crustaceans, crabs versus snails. That's how marine zoology was really organized by taxonomy. Ricketts's big contribution was that animals lived in communities in different physical zones in the intertidal region. And depending on what the physical properties of the zones were would determine what biological communities lived there. So everything was organized by habitat and community, not by species or taxonomy. And that idea of intertidal zonation grew and flowered and became the basis for much of the ecological theory that we've come to understand. He was looking at ecological concepts as they were just emerging, understanding that the connection between individuals, groups, and where they existed, how they lived, was not just a function of being an animal in a tide pool, but a function of humanity. He was trying to understand how humans live and how they function in the world. It had been long Ricketts' dream to catalog marine invertebrates um, up and down the west coast. Uh, and he wanted to go from Baja to the Queen Charlottes and probably up to Sitka. And they wanted to go to the Sea of Cortez, and it was Steinbeck's gift, really, to Ricketts to pay for the trip. They went down there with open minds and hearts in ways that scientists often cannot do. I think of them as observant people people who um, were infinitely curious. And I do believe that perhaps their greatest bond was their respect for each other's curiosity. They made the trip aboard the Western Flyer, a 77-foot fishing boat built to catch sardines and haul them to the processing plants on Monterey, California's Cannery Row. Western Flyer symbolizes to me the kind of essence of the Sea of Cortez journey for Steinbeck and Ricketts. It became their home, it became their lab, it became the site of new friendships, new connections. The fact that the crew became deputy scientists, all of it is indicative of what that trip was. Bob Ania is related to two of the crew members who made the trip, Western Flyer's captain, Tony Berry, and the ship's cook, Sparky Ania. Torres Sparky Ania was my father's brother. Tony Berry married my father's sister, Rose. Everybody called her Tootsie. He was the only skipper of the Western Flyer on the Sea of Cortez, so that was pretty special. The voyage gave birth to an extraordinary book, and it became the definitive scientific reference about Sea of Cortez marine invertebrates. More than that, it inspired readers to explore their links to nature and the world beyond their personal horizons. Tony Berry fished Western Flyer until Monterey's sardine industry showed signs of wearing itself out. He sold her seven years after returning from the Sea of Cortez. 
After that, most people simply forgot about Monterey's most famous fishing boat. But not everyone. I just asked my Uncle Tony if he knew where the boat was one day, and he said, I think it's up north, but I'm not sure. He had sold it to a guy in Oregon, and I started asking different skippers if they knew anything about the Western Flyer. Nobody did, because when it went north, it was out of their realm. They didn't consider it. Finally, I asked my Uncle Tony if he could think of anything that would identify the boat, and he only could think of it was the radio call sign. I did call the Coast Guard at Alameda, and finally I got to the right guy. By the time Bob found Western Flyer, she'd had several owners, gotten a new name, and she'd fallen into disrepair. Efforts to buy and return her to Monterey faltered, and she remained tied to a pier near Anacortes, Washington, where she sank and was refloated twice. Now she's under restoration in Port Townsend, Washington. It's probably going to be one of the most important things I've ever been involved with. I had no idea the boat was so important to so many people. Last summer I had a great opportunity. I met with this couple and they had, they had been donors of the project. And halfway through lunch I asked him, I said, so, so you know, I'm really curious. What's your connection to this project? And he starts to tell me this story about how he was a, a third year uh, accounting student in, in university. And he reads the log from the Sea of Cortez, and he goes to his new wife of six months, and he says, honey, I think I gotta go somewhere else. I gotta change my path. And he drops out of college, and they move to Austin, Texas, and he enrolls in the zoology department at the University of Texas, and it changes his entire life. And it's simple stories like that that I hear almost every day. The fact that Steinbeck and Ricketts created their sublime moment together aboard Western Flyer creates an absolutely indelible set of images that can be evoked powerfully when you lay your eyes on that boat, even under its current condition where it hasn't been restored. It's an historic boat, but at the same time, it's a piece of beauty, it's a piece of art. The most important part of the project at this phase is really to stabilize the condition of the boat. It's to establish that structure, that original sweeping shape the shipwrights tackled those first primary timbers. They, they went to work on the shear line, the clamp shape, that long, sweeping line for infinity that we all love. They systematically, over the last year, would remove a piece of wood, determine the shape that it used to be, a little bit of old, a little bit of new, and they would recut that piece of wood and install it in the boat. She's a pretty fragile old girl, so the process is a slow and systematic repair. Restoring Western Flyer is a fantastic project in all the ways that it can connect people to the history of the Sea of Cortez narrative, the voyage, the real experiences of Steinbeck and Ricketts in 1940. It can also connect people to those things now. It can connect people to the scientists, to the writers, to the people who are still exploring, still studying. It's a catalyst. The idea of the boat is to honor its past and its historic nature. A lot of historical things happened on its decks, but we want it to not be just a museum piece or something from the past. We want it to be a state-of-the-art research vessel, which will provide people the tools they need that they can investigate their environment more critically and, and more thoroughly. Even a beat-up old saner, an old fish boat, can be a starship. And that is something that kids need to know about. The education mission of the foundation is the most important part of the program. The boat is going to be the ambassador for the program, and we're all proud of it. It's the iconic sort of symbol of the foundation. We really do want to break down some of the barriers between the, the traditional roles of science and, and art. If you really bring science and art and music and humanities together so that students are writing about experiments in plankton toes, if they're drawing pictures of what plankton look like under the microscope, for instance. To have that sense of really linking science and humanity is what makes this an absolutely unique potential experience for students. The city of Monterey has graciously uh, agreed to provide us a birthing facility in, in Monterey along the old Coast Guard Pier. 
The idea for the Western Flyer is to spend about 26 weeks a year in Monterey, and then alternative years we'll go either south towards the Sea of Cortez and visit ports all along the way. Other years we'll go north towards uh, Sitka, Alaska and visit ports along the way. We want to work with the local communities, hear their problems, what they think is important, and then we'll work with them in advance of the visit to facilitate and to help design a scientific approach to what they think are the important problems. Being able to take young people out on the water and show them the environment they live in could inspire them to do great things. And someday they'll come back to the Western Flyer. They'll be a 50-year-old man or a 50-year-old woman. And they'll step foot on that boat and they'll remember that connection and how it inspired them to go and do great things in their life. I'm pretty excited about it because it's a testament to, first of all, the Western Boat Building Company. They built a boat even though it had all kinds of experiences and wrecks and crashes and stuff, it survived and the boat has sort of a special spirit.